Hey, hey, Brendan, great to connect back up. It's been a long time. Excited to meet with you. Yeah, great to see you again, Paul. How you been? All is good. You know, hey, 2023, it's, it's already a crazy year. Like stock market is like popping back up. I'm still seeing a lot of really sad news across, you know, SaaS and, and tech in terms of layoffs, but hopefully those two things kind of even out or hopefully there's, there's some progress here, but I'm excited. Yeah. The wonk, the wonkiness continues. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah. I've, I've kind of stopped it, trying to predict anything or even kind of keep up with what's happening this week. It just, I don't know, even when I, the, the second I get a grasp of it, it's like, Oh no, it just whiplashes the other way. So <laughs> I'm just, I'm just enjoying the ride at this point. <laughs> that's yeah. That's a good word for it. Yeah. Whiplash. It does feel like, well, let's just hang on, but excited to get to kind of pivot and go into, you know, everything founder led growth and, and hear about, you know, what you have been building and what you're seeing from your vantage point in the market. So could you just, so it's not just me talking, could you introduce yeah. yourself, just give a quick, you know, snapshot of um, your current business that you founded and, and kind of what's the problem that you all are taking on? Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Brendan. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Groundswell and Groundswell is built to help companies identify what are the product usage signals that matter for their business, and then what are the plays that they should run off the back of those product usage signals. So we're very focused on PLG companies, but focused more so on the sales development, sales, and even customer success side of the house. So basically trying to get all of that juicy but oftentimes messy data of product usage into the hands of sellers so that they can use it as the best intent data source that it is excellent well we're gonna get dive into everything that you're seeing and your current size but i'm actually going to swing us all the way back to the beginning so if it's okay i'm going to share my screen um, sure. and, and read off you know what we see on on linkedin actually and just I'll kind of start, you know, bottom to top and then ask you a couple of questions and then we'll actually dive in. So if you're listening, I'll try to read it off, but it looks like, you know, way back in the day, 2010, 2011, you started out as an SDR at Avista Solutions, then moved over to head of sales at Wiser Solutions, then went to Hexa, which was acquired by Outbound Works. And it looks like you founded that. Mm -hmm. um, and VP of sales over at Outbound Works, which I definitely have heard of. I remember that, that company. Um, and then I'm really interested to know about your revenue engine days. So you were a consultant. And then you were leading up at Zoom, the BDR operations and enablement manager. And then it looks like about two years ago, you know, got the, the, the real burst to go found Groundswell. And it's like, that's what we'll talk about. But did I miss anything big in there? That was it. Yeah, that, okay. that, so link that's it. Um, yeah, it's it's accurate. <laughs> um, yeah, I think the the TLDR has been in sales, B two B SaaS for the better part of the decade, and yeah, starting as an SDR, kind of worked my way up. Joined, was lucky to join Wiser, early days, first employee. Took it kind of from, you know, one employee to I think we were at about. 100 and before it, it got acquired and then yeah i think like basically zero in revenue up to just shy of 10 million in revenue so was part of that journey i think that i, I call that like the mba for me that was like my master's degree in SaaS and, and the revenue engine specifically on at SaaS companies and yeah, after that, decided to, to start a company and, and this is Groundswell is my second company now. So that's a whole nother adventure. But at the end of the day, honestly, being a founder is a lot of selling. So yeah, there's, there's a story to be woven between those. It's so, it's so great that that's where you started and you got your kind of entryway into SaaS as an SDR. That's the same, same position for me. That was my first couple roles. What was your worst job ever? <laughs> Yeah, totally. I've done some some funky jobs. Um, worst job ever. I don't know. I 
I mean, honestly, my first SDR job was pretty horrible, <laughs> to be completely <laughs> honest. That was probably my worst job. I, I think about like I've washed bikes before. I've been a, a a server at a restaurant and a host at a restaurant. Like, I don't know. Those are like kind of fun. Maybe I have uh, rose colored glasses looking back at them. Um, but there was definitely dirty parts of uh, of washing greasy bikes in hundred degree weather on in the summer. Yeah, the the SDR gig. It's funny. The SDR job that I got out of college was like basically just like a random job i didn't really understand what it meant even when i accepted the job like i didn't really get what it meant and then like two days in maybe three days in i was like oh i get the hang of this job um this is going to be a grind (laughs) this is not going to be a ton of fun and six months later i was still in that same position where i was like oh this is a grind this is not much fun you know when i flipped over then to being an sdr at wiser it's basically the same exact job, but I'm selling instead of to loan officers, basically banks and credit unions, I'm now selling to retailers and manufacturers. So maybe the conversations, the day-to-day is more interesting. The product, maybe I understand better and I kind of empathize with it, but it was night and day going from you know an SDR at Avista Solutions to an SDR at Wiser. So I don't necessarily even think it was like just the SDR job, although it can certainly be a grind. I think the environment, what you're selling, how much you believe in it, your team, leadership, all of that plays such an important part. So yeah, I don't know how I would even be able to advise myself on choosing better out of the gates if I were to do that. But I do think that um, the same role at a different company or in a different space can make a huge difference. Take us back to the early days of Groundswell. Yeah. So can you think back to two months before you really launched Groundswell or when you were really kind of in the Genesis moment, can you bring us into what were you thinking? You know, did you have lots of time and lots of runway? Were you starting to kind of split your, your days and nights and you were straddling something and then you, you had to let it go? Like take us back to the early days of before Groundswell kind of popped up. Yeah, sure. So I was at Zoom when kind of I came across this problem. So it was pretty straightforward. Actually, I was I was helping the BDR team at Zoom. And the B, there's about 150 BDRs in that organization. They roll up to marketing, they do net new sales, but they also do upsells and cross sales as part of their motion. So BDRs, synonymous with SDRs. I was doing operations and enablement for that team. And part of that job was like figuring out, okay, what is the workflow? What is the optimal workflow? And helping them be more effective as well as kind of managing the systems that they use, right? Including the the tool stack. And yeah, it was kind of clear to me, like there, there's all this, at least from the outside, before I joined Zoom, it's like there's the, the treasure trove of data that is Zoom users. And to me, as someone that hadn't spent a ton of time at a PLG company, Um, I was like, oh man, this is gold. Like if I was a BDR, I would just be going and out of my target accounts, I would just go find the people that are using my product the most. Like that's my call down list, right? It's not who just raised funding or who just got a new VP of IT because it's my key persona. It's like, yeah, just go reach out to the companies that are using my product already. And what I found is that data is actually not very easy to get into the hands of salespeople. You can get it in the hands of salespeople, you know, via a Tableau dashboard, which is what we did at Zoom. But you still typically need somebody in, you know, data to help you build that Tableau dashboard because you probably don't have the keys to it. Um, so iterations on it are kind of slow and clunky. And then reps don't really love working out of Tableau. You also don't really know what they're doing in Tableau. So it's interesting that I was doing operations and enablement, meaning once that operational data is in there, you still have to enable the team on how to actually decipher this data, look for it in this data, and then what play to run off the back of this data. And then the final thing is like, you want to automate things off the back of certain signals, right? And so instead of having a a person, a, a sales rep, SDR or AE manually reaching out, there's certain scenarios where you want to set up a play and operationalize an automated play. And that's not possible with, with Tableau. And it's, you got to, piecemeal together a bunch of different tools if you want to do it, you know, in Salesforce. This is the thing that I was kind of trying to help 
Zoom do? And yeah, ultimately I was just like, okay, there's, there's gotta be a prob- product out there to do this. And when I went, went out and looked at the time, like there was nothing that was really doing this thing. And yeah, I also just felt like, hey, this is probably a big problem that outside of product usage, there's like a lot of other intent signals that I wanna operationalize as a operations person that's building strategy. And so that's the other kind of longer term vision. Did you do any fact finding or did you do market feedback? Like mm-hmm. how did you kind of, you know, put your hand to the door and say like, this is a hot space. Like I'm totally. going to go all in. Yeah. It's a, it's a hot space now in hindsight, a year and a half later at the time, I don't, it, it wasn't really a hot space. Now there's like, you know, a new, new competitor in this space pops up every week. <laughs> there's probably like a company to serve PLG companies that would, that would be, that would do well. There's like a big market for that alone. <laughs> But at the time, it wasn't that obvious, and it quickly did. And I think the the market at the time, kind of the boom of the market also fueled that. In terms of validation, yeah, I definitely had that personal experience. I'd also been a rep before, so I had kind of that other kind of previous personal experience to pull from. But then I also validated this with a lot of other companies. I didn't want this to be like a siloed problem. And... I did a ton of customer discovery calls. I met my co-founders and they helped with that as well. Setting up both at kind of the end user level and the kind of executive or admin level discovery around this problem. Um, you know, is this something that you struggle with? And then, you know, the mom test, if, if anyone listening has not read that and is trying to do customer discovery now, this is like the book that I would recommend. This is like the manual for customer discovery is, is uh, the mom test. You don't want to ask your mom, is this a good idea for a product? Cause she's going to say, yeah, of course, it's a great idea, honey. You want to ask strangers. You want to ask people that are not going to give you a very nice affirmative answer like your mom probably will. <laughs> and so, yeah, the, we, I, I probably talked to 50 to hundred different people in maybe a three month period to validate that this was indeed a problem for other companies outside of, of Zoom. Could you share what's the makeup of like your customer count or, you know, what's the status of your revenue, your size today? So we can kind of contextualize. Yeah, absolutely. So we're working with about a dozen companies right now. The way that we've actually worked is, it's interesting. We're, we're really at an inflection point right now where, yeah, we could talk a little bit about this. Actually, it's pretty timely as it relates to founder-led growth. I would say early days, first few months were like customer discovery. Let's understand the problem. Let's not try to build anything yet. Then we kind of transitioned to like, okay, let's build this solution and let's iterate. And, you know, what we're building, we're building a pretty robust platform that's taken about 12 months to develop. It's just myself and my co-founder is also selling, but it's just us that are selling right now. So it's very much so founder led sales. And we're starting to actually go out now in the coming months where we'll actually be like going to market and trying to kind of bring on more customers each month and convert those into paid, paid customers. Yeah. So thanks for sharing. So you've got, you know, more than 12 customers, you're starting to kind of build your own founder led sales motion. Do you, for other founders who are either earlier or later, how do you, how do you kind of, you know, run the, run the rest of this year forward? Like at what point do Mm -hmm. you start to see bringing in the right sales assistance? And like, you know, you've got the experience, like, would you, would you continue to drive this, the sales motion and and hire some, a couple of players who are more junior who can help you with top of funnel or Like, how do you kind of see, like, you know, when the window opens, it's the right, how are you going to kind of develop your sales motion? Yeah, it's a good question. I think for, for me, I generally think it's good for the founder to run sales as, as long as they kind of can. I think that, you know, I have some experience personally selling as an SDR, I've done outbound as an AE, I've closed deals, I've done, you know, million dollar a year quota 
personally, and then I've managed a sales team. So I do have a little bit of experience, but I'm definitely not great at sales and I'm still trying to learn. And I have advisors around me. I was on a call on Friday with an advisor who is like coaching me on like, <laughs> here's how to do an intro discovery sales call. And here's what you should follow up with. And here's how you should set a pilot up and, you know, kind of sales one-on-one stuff. So I'm still for sure learning these things. I do think for us at our stage, we're not, we're not at the point yet where we want to like scale a crazy amount. And so I think it's also important for, for me anyway, to still be really close to that customer, primarily for like product iteration purposes. Um, so I'd say that's like the big distinguishing thing is, you know, do you as a founder, do you want to still own product and, and get customer feedback to feed that feedback loop? Or do you feel comfortable enough to outsource, you know, you've built a repeatable model, you've closed, you know, whatever X amount of revenue month over month, three months in a row or six months in a row, you've proven a, a model that's repeatable. Great. Now the next test is let me go put one or two people in that seat and see if they can do it without, you know, the, the founder secret sauce, which is often kind of, maybe you're not selling 40 plus hours a week, but you do have kind of a little bit of extra oomph as a founder. So that, that's how I'm looking at it. I think that's like probably, you know, we could talk about this. I'm happy to, to share whatever is helpful, but um, I think the, the funding is the other part of it of like how much revenue you're trying to get to, how much funding do you have? What is your next funding milestone? I think that also plays into things of when you want to um, hire salespeople or a head of sales, things like this. I mean, I love the ethos of like founders should stay close and should be driving and even past when it, it starts to feel repeatable, like they should, they should hang as a part of the process as long as they can. Can you go a little bit more kind of into this fundraising? What are you hearing in your circles of advisors and investors to do? Yeah, I, I think it's, <laughs> it's kind of a wild west out there i'd say from from what i'm seeing like first of all i'm seeing i'm seeing like things the variety of answers i've heard is is kind of greater than anything i've heard in the past six months so i have no idea honestly like I, i'm not fundraising right now so i'll let you know for sure <laughs> when we go out to fundraise like what what it actually looks like out there <clears throat> you know i think we're on the early side kind of seed stage is a little bit more protected. I think later stage is, is a little trickier. These thousand X ARR companies or hundred X ARR companies like that raised an A in 2021 or something like this. I, I don't know. I don't know what these people are doing, what their plan is. I guess just let that runway get them through for the next five years. But yeah, I think from, from my perspective, like, yeah, it's kind of back to the fundamentals, right? Like I was listening to a Jason Lemkin podcast yesterday and he's talking about, you know, the 2016 crash and the multiples and the compression of mul multiples today. And, you know, if you're at 5X ARR next year's revenue, like, sure, you could look at it that way. But if you're expecting the market's going to bottom out and in six months, the market's going to like, you know, come back up, like back up is not what it was in 2021. And so I think that's, that's my mindset for sure. I think that probably is the mindset of most founders and, and the advice that they're getting that, uh, yeah, there's just not going to be 2021 days ever again, probably certainly not like this year or next year. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that's, that's my take. I, you know, there's obviously like, there's a bunch of dry powder that people talk about. Where is that going to be deployed? There's also like, talk of, oh, it's going to get worse this year. So you should go raise sooner rather than later. Um, I think investors are obviously, it's to their advantage to talk about, you know, valuations need to come down and you need to have more revenue and you need to button up your metrics. And so I think this, this shakeup is a positive thing for the SaaS space. It's definitely a bummer to see a bunch of layoffs, but the reality is like people were getting ahead of themselves in a lot of ways over the last few years. And so it's good to reset and it's good to like actually care about what is your revenue and what is your 
net dollar retention and, and you know, basic metrics to, uh, that kind of just weren't reported on for the last few years. How did you go about assembling your group of advisors and when you think of your current investing group and investors or when you think forward to like the next or when you mm-hmm. go for a series A, like really what stands out? What's the most the most value add or where is the, the places you start to look for? Like, this is what I think I need. This is what I think they will bring and help. I would say the thing that we were trying to optimize for is people that understood our space. So for us, you know, we raised money from Village Global GTM fund, and then mostly angel investors from primarily PLG companies. So we wanted to surround ourselves with people who had lived and breathed this PLG motion and and ideally people that were on this side who had felt this pain and were excited about kind of the, the vision that we were building out. So, you know, angel investors from Slack, DocuSign, Snowflake, Workato, uh, et cetera. I think the other thing to mention there is like, so we, we, I met my co-founder in On Deck and Village Global, Eric Tornberg over there also is, is at Village Global started On Deck. And so he, we connected with him and really liked the idea of, of working with him for their pre-seed round. So he's been great to work with. Um, And then GTM fund is like, they're just the perfect partner for us. I've known Max for many years and Scott as well. And they totally understand the space and the problem that we're solving. And then also kind of the tech stack that's tangential to what we're building at Groundswell, the partner landscape. And then also of course the customer landscape. I think they also have an amazing and unique funnel for talent on the go-to market side across the board, but, but definitely more so on the go-to market side. So that's a great resource. And uh, yeah, I mean, I I would say like shout them out there. They're definitely like the highest ROI for, from, from our perspective of dollar into value added. (laughs) Thanks for kind of laying those out. Cause I think, you know, on deck and village global and GTM fund, like those are going to be three really good resources for others, you know, listening. I did an LP back a year or two ago with stage two capital and I've, you know, been talking with them and seeing their accelerator launch out connections and product feedback and partnership, maybe, you know, roadmap and, and obviously help with pipeline as well. So no, congrats so far. I wanted to ask you How do you pick the right tool to get the right job done? So how do you even, you know, sign up and swipe your credit card? How do you buy as a founder, like different SaaS tools or different service tools? And then at the same, you know, same slant would be, when do you tap in advisors or contractors or, you know, Fiverr? Like, how do you kind of think through all those ways to get help and, and kind of, still keep things lean and mean? Yeah, it's a good question. I think there's there's a lot of space to be creative here. On the cost cutting side of things, of course, but also just like optimizing things, being able to, um, you know, spin up technology and people around you when you need it very quickly. So I think that's that's an advantage that we've found of working with contractors where we're able to bring somebody on quickly, ramp them up quickly versus, you know, full-time hires is a lengthier process. I would say on the technology side of things, you know, I, I'm, I don't know that I have anything terribly unique to say other than what I've experienced lately is, is even if it's a very low cost tool or even free, or maybe they have some sort of freemium, you know, component to their, to their solution. Like, I, I think that it, it's super helpful for me when there's like somebody that can just help me set the thing up. Like I just, I've found myself wanting to be like, look, I'm, I'm buying this software, but like, you're probably an expert in this software. Like just give me 30 minutes of your time to set this up in the optimal way so that I can just avoid a bunch of the potholes. So I think that's like, I don't know, maybe it's annoying to do or something or, 
maybe people just want to try to figure it out themselves. But for me, I'm like, I, I would rather just, let me just get the shortcut and like, tell me, you know, if I'm going to buy whatever Apollo for sequencing, just like, Hey, let me screen share and just help me set up my first two sequences. What are the best practices? How long should they be? Right. How long should a subject line be? Should I have images in my signature? Like these people that are vendors have a lot of this knowledge that I'm sure a lot of it's documented somewhere, but like, I don't want to read hundreds of pages of documents. So just that 30, 30 minutes as a founder is super, super impactful for me. Just asking that simple question of like, how, how are, how are the best companies using this product? Can you just help me set it up that way to start? Just give me 80% of the way there is like in 30 minutes. I think that's, that's a very high impact thing you can do with your time. So that kind of it makes me think about, well, where's the balance of sales and product led growth? Where's it all going? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I mean, I, I love hearing that as a, as a, you know, I'm an advocate for sales and I, you know, I've been a you know sales manager. And like we said, we both started as SDRs. So when that's the, when that's the viewpoint, like in the past few years, it seems like there's definitely a big gravitational pull where buyers are enjoying either setting up their own account or making purchase decisions online and doing their own, you know, low touch or no touch. Yep. So with product led growth, you know, my question to you would just be like, how are, how are you seeing it evolve? What, what maybe is like the, the right balance? Like will sales teams continue to, you know, have a, a broad layer of account executives that are all servicing net new customers or, you know, what are some trends you're seeing with like your top customers and, and conversations about product led growth? Yeah, totally. So I think that first of all, product led growth does not mean no salespeople. You know, Zoom has 2000 salespeople and they're like notorious PLG company. <clears throat> so we can get that out of the way. PLG does not equal no salespeople. Yeah, can however, you say, that, say that again. <laughs> for yeah, before we... However, there is a however. I do think that it's changing the job of a salesperson, right? So, so PLG, and I think it's good for both the salesperson and for the buyer. I think what, what I've experienced firsthand and observed in other companies, including kind of the best PLG companies out there, is that the sellers are becoming more consultative and that there's lines that are blurring between sales and customer success. And what I mean by that is, when somebody comes inbound using your product, you should treat them very differently than if they had come in as a hand raiser requesting a demo. They may be using your product for six months or for two years. You should know that information and you should meet them with that information so that you're not talking to some value prop that they're super aware of or that's highly irrelevant to them. Right. Now, obviously, got to show groundswell, like, that's where we come in is like giving salespeople that information because otherwise oftentimes salespeople are blind in those conversations or blind to know when they should engage with those people. Now, I think on the other side of things is like once you're actually engaged in, a, in an opportunity and a sales conversation, yeah, you might actually close that deal. You know, companies like Figma, for instance, the AE actually owns that account for the first six months of their existence for certain territories, right? So you as an AE are, are literally kind of this land and expand model is like, you're literally tasked not just to close that first deal, but what does that deal look like six months out, right? And so I think that's where you're, you know, I, I, I can speak at least from my experience managing salespeople, like I've seen very bad behaviors with reps trying to just close the deal at the highest amount possible to get that kicker, to get that, you know, extra 20% on their commission check because of the way that we've set up our, you know, commission calculations. And then there's, there's clawback or there's sandbagging. There's all sorts of weird behaviors versus what you really want as a business is like this smooth month over month trajectory of growth. And so I think the PLG and sales, this intersection definitely aligns the business, but then also aligns the buyer. Of course, they can come in and they can spend $500 a month and test it out for a few months. But then as they see value, they're going to start paying, you know, $5,000 a month or whatever. 
And so the customer um, is going to be able to capture that upside. I also think that there is going to be less work for SDRs. It's interesting that, you know, you and I both came up as an SDR. I think that's like a very natural thing, especially in tech. It's a good entryway into the tech space and, and SaaS specifically. Um, I, I don't know in five years what that will look like in terms of SDR growth and new people being onboarded as, as SDRs. I think technology will probably chip away at some of that. I don't think the SDR is going away at all. And I definitely don't think like discovery is going away. I think maybe there's going to be like a more full sales cycle type role that emerges and becomes more prolific, prolific. But, but I think that's the other trend to kind of consider is like, I, I don't think companies should just blindly say like, yeah, SDR model is how it's always been done the last 10 years. That's what we should do. I think you should really understand the nuances of your business and figure out if that's the best model for your business. Just to kind of bring it all back full circle, like the, it's interesting about how you're saying Zoom, they have that BDR function that actually rolls up to marketing. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've heard of that in the past. And I just wonder maybe in five years, that entry role that we both experience as an SDR, maybe it's just some other type of, it's a content role or it's a product role. Like who knows what org, you know, where you'll start, but it seems like as long as you're picking up the skills and you're able to learn, then there'll be different growth paths. Yeah, exactly. It'll go somewhere. I think, yeah, maybe product, maybe content, maybe, you know, an analyst, something like this, <clears throat> you know, maybe it's customer success or support, something like that. But people are going to find their way into SaaS companies and, and there's going to be an entry level position. And, you know, you got to remember too, like a lot of pipeline for internal hiring is, you know, for AEs is, is for SDRs at that company. So I think that's another advantage or, or bull case for, uh, for SDRs continuing to exist beyond the, uh, the generative AI wave that we're experiencing right now. How are you looking at 2023 and your own pipeline? I'm going to ask everyone this question to compare. Are you focused on outbound? Are you focused on virtual events, on partnerships or another avenue? But like, where would you, where would you earmark a, a big chunk of your pipeline coming from in 2023? Yeah, for us, we're still pretty early stage to so take it with a grain of salt, but we're pretty focused on like specific companies. We have a target account list that we're going to start going after. So it's less of like, <clears throat> our playbook is less of like educational. Let's like educate the market on product-led sales. I think there's companies that are doing that, which is awesome. We're less focused on that right now. I think in the, in the short term, you know, for the rest of this year, we're really focused on bringing on board great companies that are going to help us develop our product. So that's like maybe some outbound but primarily through investors and advisors, warm intros. We use Cabal, which is an awesome tool for that, especially at the early stage. They do investor update uh, stuff as well. We use Apollo internally. They're great. It's like a database plus sales engagement tool together. And then we also use, I've been using Surf for LinkedIn, which is a great tool, especially at the early stage. Um, I'm sure they're at the late stage too, but for me, it's been awesome. So those are the main ones. I think digital events, maybe. I think there's probably an interesting thing for us where we can get some sort of like small group of people who are actually like sharing best practices, you know, a group of 10 to 20 people, maybe. I personally just don't love webinars a ton. Like I don't seem to go to webinars. So I feel like I probably w probably won't lean into that too much. Maybe we'll see kind of a, a boom come back to uh, in real life events. So we might yeah. learn there a little bit as well. Well, yeah, yeah. Hopefully maybe we can get sent two free tickets to Saster. Maybe that's what, if anyone's listening or we can, yes. we can try to work some connections, but it would, great, would, it would be great to see you at a local event, but really enjoyed just getting carved out time to catch up and, and ask you these questions and kind of hear your take. So congrats on building out Groundswell and all the best this year. Appreciate it, Paul. Great to catch right. up.